A writer knows where beginnings and endings go in a story, but world building, while just as important, doesn't have a designated time or place. Put it at the beginning and the story is ready for fantasy right away, or put it at the end and recontextualize the piece as a whole, but that risks compromising an interesting intro with a history lesson or leaving the audience confused for the run of the narrative. Once you add in the interactive, nonlinear, and subjective nature of gaming, things can get exponentially more complicated. When can a story afford to slow down and give some historical context to the story's present? How can that fictional history be just as enthralling as a story with a beginning, middle, and end? And how can a player be dropped in a fleshed out fantasy world, oblivious to its lore, without being lost? First things first, how can we organically flesh out a backstory without messing up the main narrative? In my previous video on how to start a game story, I made the point that a lore dump or narration is a bad way to go, since directly addressing the audience isn't very effective at capturing their imagination. This holds true since folks tend to be more interested in human drama over big picture ideas like a political climate or a mythic canon, but if the information is presented as a mystery to solve, then a game can use in media res to spice things up. By turning tidbits of lore into collectibles, information suddenly shifts from a boring old preamble justifying why the game can occur to another rewarding puzzle to overcome. Obvious example, Dark Souls turns each piece of equipment into delicious, delicious world building. That nets you a nice eureka effect when combined with the environmental storytelling. For example, you learn from the Watchtower basement key that a hero turned hollow was locked up by their own friend, quote unquote, for their own good. There you find a knight wearing Havel's set. On death they drop a ring which explains that Havel and Gwyn were battlefield compatriots, likely making him the friend in question. Cross-reference that with the occult club found next to his armor beneath Anor Londo, and suddenly it seems that the knight was locked up for scheming to kill his fellow gods. When I explain it here, it sounds needlessly obtuse, but that's what makes it so satisfying to unravel in the game. If this were all explained in a cutscene, then it wouldn't be half as satisfying to break into. But since it's a mystery, it becomes some of the best storytelling in gaming, all while juggling an entirely different Ludo narrative where the player is fighting knights and looting hidden chambers. It's establishing the background without stopping the story's momentum. Another good example could be the flashbacks from Breath of the Wild. The main character of that game is largely Hyrule itself, so when the game challenges you to find a bunch of locations just off a photograph, it's pretty satisfying as a side quest. Here the lore serves as an answer to how this big world fits together, and rewards your curiosity when you remember something you saw earlier. Your main objective is to remember all of Hyrule's secrets, and recalling all these significant locations is both the process and product of that mission. Now that we know how to implement a backstory into a different narrative, the next hurdle is making the backstory compete and synergize with the rest of the story. What makes for actually interesting lore? Well, the question behind any bit of lore is, how did this happen? So that's the mystery you want the player to be trying to unravel. A bit vague, let's take that example from before. On its surface, the player is probably not invested in who's locked up where for whatever reason. Reading that key's description isn't particularly exciting. The player is more likely interested in the shortcut potential than they are in whatever baddie they'll have to take out when they get there. The thing is, Havel is fucking badass. He's got the beefiest armor in the game and an attack that'll instant kill most first time players. Taking him out is an intricate dance of punishing his every move with lights and never overcommitting. It's easy if you know what you're doing, but overconfidence is just as much of a death sentence as hesitation is, so the player always needs to be focused if they want to win. What I'm trying to say is the fight is an interesting one, and even the loot you get from it is very practical for almost any build, so that will pique the player's interest. That's what makes the player ask, who was that? Which starts the snowball rolling. With that said, good world building has to be consistent. You can't have a hidden item implying there was a underground rebellion growing right underneath the gods' noses beneath Anne Orlando, and then turn around and put a giant random skull in the Ashen Lake just because. You can't have tombstones of powerful enemies to show how far the calamity reached into each region, and then throw a ruined guardian atop a giant pillar for seemingly no reason. Not without conditioning players into inspecting something that might not have any satisfying answers. Now we run into a major issue though. If the lore is a mystery, what happens to players who are either apathetic to or unaware of the puzzle? What happens to players who didn't get hooked? Some people just kill Havel and say that's that. Just like I said before, players will be more invested in the goings on of the lead characters than they are in the big picture, so the secret is a more personal main narrative. 
The final act can be as historically unprecedented as literally possible, but people care more about themselves in the end. Bringing it back to Dark Souls, you can go through the game a number of times and never even look at the Watchtower basement key, but at the end of the game you know you're supposed to be succeeding Lord Gwyn, because Grant tells you straight up. So when you beat the game and end up as a human sacrifice, you can't help but feel tricked. You don't really care about the implications of ending the Age of Light. You want to get even with that toothy cock. That's why you go with the other ending on your next run, and hopefully you run into what you missed out on on your second time through. I'm worried that this video is becoming a bit too Soulsy. It's just convenient. It's a popular game, so I don't need to spend too much time breaking down how what story is told. For the sake of variety, let's spice things up with some Talos Principle. Recommended game? Spoiler warning. The robotic character awakens to a disembodied voice of a godlike figure calling itself Elohim, which promises you eternal life if you solve his video game puzzles without ever going to some mysterious tower. However, over the course of the game, you run into a bunch of corrupted text documents, which all seem to reference some apocalyptic calamity, and you can't help but notice all of Elheim's robotic personality quirks. If you solve the mystery, it becomes clear that you're actually playing as a computer program undergoing a recursive Turing test, in an attempt to repopulate the world with sentient life after some unspecified disaster wiped out humanity. But similar to Dark Souls, you run into a decent, if unexpected, ending either way. Fail to defy Elheim and prove you have free will, and you go to a digital heaven where your memories reset, your behavior is mutated, and your program run through the trials again, where maybe a future generation can achieve personhood. This ending is again not necessarily a bad one, but it does leave players who didn't solve the mystery feeling tricked, so they're likely to go through again and get the quote unquote good ending where they Turing test the Turing tester and get their consciousness downloaded into a real world body, where they can essentially live on as a real person. The game rewards you for learning the lore not just with rich storytelling, but also with the opportunity to net yourself a better ending. To break it down, lore is more rewarding as a mystery with a nice hook on it than just a justification to play pretend. It's no substitute for a human narrative, but it helps one feel grander. A healthy backstory is great at demanding engagement and triggering a eureka, but a few errors in continuity can leave fans disappointed with answerless questions. To get world building right is to create questions and then allow the player to figure out the answers for themselves through investigation. That's how the player gets curious, how they get invested, and how they can get lost in a world without getting lost in a narrative. 